Hello, everyone. As we are, um, as everyone is uh, uh, logging on to our uh, special presentation today with the artist Edgardo Miranda Rodriguez to talk about his uh, graphic novel series, La Boring Kenya. Um, and I want to start by giving a shout out to the uh, teachers and their classrooms that are joining us today. Um, and just to say, I'm uh, Michelle Porsche. I'm associate director for uh, uh, community outreach at the Schwab Dyslexia and Cognitive Diversity Center. And thank you all for coming today. Um, so a special hello and thank you to these uh, teachers in their classrooms. Jessica Vaughn at Arroyo High School, Karina Soriano Ponce at West Contra Costa Unified School District, Aliyah Lucan at Dewey Academy High School, Edith Arias at Access uh, San Francisco Unified School District, Anna Bryant at Guadalupe Elementary School, Jessica Cabrales at Cesar Chavez Middle School, Jenny Jimenez at Pine Hollow Middle School, Jazzy Rodriguez at San Lorenzo High School Music Program, Sang Lee at San Francisco Unified School District, Kathleen Lucier West at Abraham Lincoln High School, Nestor Gonzalez at Oakland Unified School District, Elizabeth Shockley at San Francisco Unified School District, and Vincent Salazar at Dewey Academy. So thank you all for um, joining us today. And uh, let's say, bef and before I have uh, Dr. Lisa Fortuna introduce our speaker, I'm gonna ask our um, uh, IT um, assistant today to talk about how we'll answer questions and conversations. Yes, hello everyone. Uh, so uh, for this webinar, um, we have disabled chat. So if you wish to type in a question, uh, you can locate a Q&A button at the bottom of your screen to go ahead and type in questions. Also as well, if you wanna ask your question audibly, um, we are gonna use the raise hand feature. So go ahead and click the raise hand feature if you have a question or comment for the end. Uh, only click it once, it's gonna put you in order in which you clicked it. So just click it and uh, that'll keep your space in line. And if we have time to take questions at the end that way, we'll do so. Thank you. And uh, so just to introduce Dr. Lisa Fortuna, who is professor of clinical psychiatry at our UCSF Department of Psychiatry and Behavioral Sciences, is also the chair of psychiatry at Zuckerberg San Francisco General Hospital and vice chair of psychiatry at the University of California, San Francisco. And take it away, Dr. Fortuna. All right, so um, welcome everybody. So it is my honor to um, introduce Edgardo Miranda Rodriguez, um, who's our speaker today. I'm extremely excited as a, a, a fellow Boricua, um, Latina um, in the community. And so let's introduce Edgardo. Um, Edgardo Miranda Rodriguez is a graphic novelist most notably recognized as the writer and creator of the critically acclaimed and best-selling superhero, superhero series, La Borinquena, which we'll hear about today. Um, and La Borinquena is part of the, um, also part of a collection, a permanent collection at the Smithsonian Museum. He is a featured storyteller in HBO's documentary, Habla Now, the latest installment of the award-winning Habla series. In addition, he is the recipient of many awards, including the San Diego Comic-Con 2019 Bob Clampett Humanitarian Award for his philanthropic efforts for um, Puerto Rico and beyond via the benefit anthology Reconstruction, which um, a reminiscing and rebuilding Puerto Rico, which features La Borinquena teaming up with Wonder Woman, Superman, Batman, and other DC comic heroes, which he self-published under his own studio Somos Altes. Sales of reconstruction uh, have collected uh, close to a quarter of a million dollars and lead to the development of, the, of La Borinquena Grants Program, supporting local grassroots organizations in Puerto Rico. As the creative director and owner of Somos Alte, a Brooklyn-based creative services studio, he has worked with such notable clients as Atlantic Records, Columbia University, so Sony Pictures, and Marvel. Edgardo is a curator of art ex exhibitions, 
that have already produced three original Marvel comic book art exhibitions and his latest La Borinquena in San Juan in Puerto Rico's Fundacion Cortes. He's also an arts envoy for the U.S. Department of State. Follow Edgardo um, after this talk, hopefully for more updates on his latest projects um, on social media via Twitter at Mr. Edgardo NYC and the latest news on La Borinquena via Instagram, Facebook, and at La Borinquena Comics. So we're um, excited to have you here today and I, I, I hand it over to um, Edgardo. Thank you so much, Lisa. Good morning, everybody. Thank you, thank you for having me. I'm very excited to share with you all the story of La Borinquena. Now, every superhero that we know of um, has its own origin story. Like, how did that superhero come to be? But what I want to share with you is the story of how I was inspired to create La Borinquena and what it is that I had to learn to create this character. Now, when we think of superheroes, we know that many of them come from make-believe fictional planets that have exploded. Some of them are from fictional African countries that are squeezed in to, between real African countries and a continent in Africa. Um, some of them come from make-believe cities. Well, La Borinquena doesn't come from any place that's actually rooted in fantasy or from someone's imagination. She comes from a real island, an island by the name of Borinquen. Now, the original people of Puerto Rico were called the, called the Tainos. The Tainos were the indigenous, the original inhabitants of this island. And they referred to their island as Borinquen in their own language. Borinquen meant land of the noble and valiant creator. But when they meant creator, they were talking about the mother goddess, the semi that they would actually call Atabe. Now you can see in this stone that I'm presenting to you, this thousands of years old, this is an image of a woman giving birth. And in giving birth, she's creating the entire universe. This mythology, this idea of who their goddess was would inspire me to create what would become this origin story for La Borinquena. But as I started learning more about Puerto Rico and Borinquen, the Tainos I learned are still around to this day. Now, although Puerto Rico was colonized by Spain, that's why the island's name was changed from Borinquen to Puerto Rico, because Puerto Rico literally translates it to the words rich port, meaning that it was a, a location that was rich with resources and gold and so much more that Spain loved to take back to their country. And the Tainos were forced into slavery. And many of them, many of them died after hundreds of years of being under uh, Spanish rule and and slavery. However, even today in Puerto Rico, there are many people that continue to celebrate, to connect, and to reestablish that heritage, that identity that makes them Taino. This is actually a photograph from Puerto Rico now of many people that are gathered to celebrate their Taino heritage, right alongside those giant stones that have the original carvings of the semi, the goddesses and gods, including Atarex. But when you talk about Puerto Rico, you can't talk about Puerto Rico and just only address the Taino heritage and the Taino ancestry. You have to also understand that there's a very major African presence in Puerto Rico. Now, right around the time when Spain had taken over the island of Puerto Rico and it enslaved many of the Tainos, well, many of the Tainos started disappearing because the population started shrinking because slavery was just so hard for them. So they brought in Africans. The Spanish brought in Africans to Puerto Rico, but not just to Puerto Rico. They brought them throughout the Caribbean and the Americas, from South America to Mexico to North America. But when they came to Puerto Rico, they came and stayed with our heritage and stayed with their identity. Today in Puerto Rico, one of the most important parts of our folkloric heritage is dance and music called bomba, bomba y plena, to be exact. Now, bomba y plena comes from West Africa, the idea of the griot. The griot was a storyteller from West Africa. Generations and generations of stories would pass on from one griot to another. With bomba y plena, history became lyrics of songs. History became movement to these dances. And that history and that heritage still lives to this day. This is a photograph from Loisa, Puerto Rico. Loisa is actually a town 
on the island of Puerto Rico that was founded originally by Africans who were freed from slavery. And even today across the island of Puerto Rico and also across the United States, wherever you find Puerto Ricans, they still dance and celebrate Bomba y Plena. In fact, I was just recently in uh, the Bay Area and I was at a cultural center called um, uh, La Perla, I believe, and there were actual Bomba classes that are still being taught in these um, cultural centers. So Bomba is not just something that's a part of Puerto Rico's heritage, it's something that's celebrated and taught across the United States. Now, when I started learning all of this history about Puerto Rico, particularly about the, the racial history of our African and Taino roots, I wanted to learn more about the island's identity, the people's nationalism, their pride in being Puerto Rico, Puerto Rican. And that's when I learned about this flag. This flag was actually created by a woman by the name of Mariana Brasetti. Mariana Brasetti was part of a revolution that in 1868 fought against the Spanish empire fought against the Spanish government to try to free themselves, to become an independent nation. That's why this flag, although it was created and still is the flag of the town of Lares in Puerto Rico, it was first identified as La Bandera de la República de Puerto Rico, the flag of the Republic of Puerto Rico. And also around that time, another woman by the name of Lola Rodriguez de Gio, who was only 25 years old at the time, actually wrote lyrics to the first national anthem of Puerto Rico, La Borinqueña. Now, if you remember, the original name of Puerto Rico is Borinquen. So when she wrote lyrics to the song La Borinqueña, it was a variation of the original name of Puerto Rico, Borinquen. La Borinqueña would be the Puerto Rican woman. And this national anthem would really celebrate this very historic moment when women and men joined forces to actually lead a revolution to, cry, to try to develop freedom and independence for themselves. That was 153 years ago. This image that I share with you right now is actually the only image that you'll actually find of Mariana Brasetti. And there she is, right on that horse with her flag, holding it, holding it high up in the sky. And alongside her are women and men holding their machetes that are ru rushing into battle. And then on the other side, you see La Borinquena flying across the screen. And beneath her, you see another image of Mariana Brasetti with her hair pulled back and in, in, in braids. You also see an image of Lola Rodriguez de Dio, who wrote the original lyrics to La Borinquena. And you see two of my mentors, women with the purple beret, Iris Morales, who was a lawyer and one of the original members of the Young Lords Party, a group of activists that had a lot of work during the civil rights era here in the United States, particularly for, for people of Latinx heritage. Marta Moreno Vega, a professor at NYU and a professor at the University of Puerto Rico who is one of the leading voices for the African diaspora. That is, she speaks to represent and to acknowledge our African heritage. And then right there also is a very important Afro-Puerto Rican woman named Felicita Mendez. Now Felicita Mendez is incredibly important for you all to understand because Felicita Mendez came to California from Puerto Rico and when she tried to enroll her students, her children into school, she wasn't allowed to because she was perceived as a woman of color, a black woman. And she and her husband ended up suing the state of California because they would not allow her children to attend school alongside her cousin. Now her cousin was also Puerto Rican, but she was a very light complexion Puerto Rican. So there was a lot of, a lot of discrimination in California. And because of this case, where her and her husband sued the state of California, they won. And schools were desegregated, meaning that schools were allowed to have students of all races alongside. There was a very important man by the name of Thurgood Marshall who actually took this case. And because of that, he was able to make a case across the United States so that no schools could separate students based on race. And that was all because of an Afro-Puerto Rican woman named Felicita Mendez, who was at the time, the mother of children in the state of California. So all of this history was so important. Now, during this historic moment of this revolution, many people ended up in prison. Many people died during the revolution. Puerto Rico was only independent for a few days. And many other Puerto Ricans ended up in New York City. They never gave up on this dream, this idea of a free Puerto Rico. So they teamed up with other Latinos who also believed in, and celebrated that same idea. And they formed La Confederación Antillana, 
the Antillean Confederacy, which referred to the Caribbean islands of Cuba, Haiti, Dominican Republic, and Puerto Rico, who teamed up together to create this alliance to try to come up with a way to fight against the Spanish Empire so that they all could become independent countries. And it was around that time, about 28 years later, that the flag that many of us know as the Puerto Rican flag would be created in New York City. And that was in 1895. That means just last December, just last year, this flag celebrated its 125th anniversary. Now that flag came to Puerto Rico and was known as Puerto Rico's flag for decades. But right around that time, it was in 1898, when the United States invaded Puerto Rico, they made everyone in the island of Puerto Rico US citizen. The first elected governor of Puerto Rico did not like the idea of independence so he created a law. The law was called La Ley de la Mordaza, the gag law. Under this law, it was illegal to own the Puerto Rican flag. It was illegal to sing the lyrics of La Borinquena. It was illegal to gather with other people to just talk about independence. Now, what's really ironic about this is that this was mostly the opposing political party of the governor, Luis Muñoz Marin. He just didn't want people to oppose his office, oppose his political party. And many people were fined $10,000. Many people went to jail for owning a Puerto Rican flag, for talking about independence, for singing La Borinquena. But interestingly enough, it was the United States who had to step in and tell Governor Luis Munoz Marin that what he was doing was unconstitutional. You see, Puerto Ricans were now US citizens. And as US citizens, they had the right of freedom of speech, the right to assembly, and the right to gather, the right to protest. Even though Munoz Marin disagreed with them as US citizens, they had the right to disagree with their governor. So he repealed the, the, he repealed the, the law, the gag law. That means he did away with it. And he made the, la the flag legal again. But when he reintroduces the flag, he changes it from the original light blue to navy blue. And that flag's history that started back in 1895 would be erased. So many people, when you talk to them about the Puerto Rican flag, they know that it was created in 1952. They don't know that there was 57 years prior to that that existed in the history of this flag. They don't know that there was an original song written by Lola Rodriguez de Dio, because the new version of La Borinquena would actually give props to Christopher Columbus because he thought our beaches were so, 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 so beautiful. That's literally how it translates from English, Spanish to English. And the Puerto Rican flag is something that many of us who are Puerto Rican who live across the United States wave with honor, wave with pride, wave with love. Even in protest here in the United States, this image that I'm sharing with you is actually from the cover of the New York Times 44 years ago today, because yesterday, 44 years ago, there were a group of Puerto Rican activists that took over the Statue of Liberty to make a political statement because they wanted their heroes, their leaders to be freed and not persecuted for their political beliefs. And it would be sometime later when President Jimmy Carter would pardon these political prisoners, these activists who spoke out for Puerto Rican independence. So all of these stories inspired me to create Marisol Rios de la Luz, a science student, a student who loves science, technology, engineering, arts, and math, STEAM, a student who is also dealing with her own weaknesses of asthma. Many young people of color across the United States, including Puerto Rico, have to deal with health issues related to the environment. Asthma, unfortunately, is one of these health issues. But it's not something that limits her, not something that slows her down or holds her back. She still rides her bicycle from Brooklyn to Manhattan every day so she can take her classes at Columbia University. She does her part to reduce the size of her carbon footprint because she believes that we all have a responsibility to save our planet. We all have to be active agents for climate action because our planet is in the face of a crisis called climate change. She still celebrates her heritage by dancing and singing bomba y plena. She is a college student 
that cares about her heritage, that cares about her family, that cares about our planet. So everything that I shared with you, all of that history about the flag and our Taino and our African heritage is what wraps around La Borinquena to make her into the superhero that she would become. And that mythology that was inspired by the original image of Atabex, the mother goddess of the Tainos, finds itself reinterpreted in the actual comics as an actual part of her origin story. And she connects to her African heritage because it's important to celebrate that in a character. It's important to acknowledge that as Latin people, we are incredibly diverse looking and existing people. We have African, indigenous, European, and Asian race in our, in our heritage, in our identity. That's why many of us look so different. Some of us look very indigenous, some of us look very African, some of us look very European, some of us have a mixture of all of that. And the character, well, it's important that she reflect that mixture as well. But oftentimes when we see Latin people, we only see one person that kind of like, it's supposed to represent all of us. If it's a beauty pageant, you'll see maybe uh, a very light complexion, sometimes even a blonde version of maybe someone who is from Puerto Rico. And not to say that you can't be blonde and be Puerto Rican, because you can, but you also can be a Black person and still be proud to be Puerto Rican, still be proud to be Latin. So all of this is what in, eventually ends up creating the character that is La Borinquena. And five years ago, we introduced the idea of La Borinquena to the world in a big way. She's, on the, uh, she's all over newspapers across the United States. She's part of the Puerto Rican Day Parade, the largest celebration of Puerto Rican culture here in the United States where hundreds of thousands of people gather. And she's dressed in this original costume that was made for her. And young people at the parade on television, over the internet are seeing La Borinquena for the first time. And she's on front pages of newspapers across the United States and people are recognizing this superhero. But I didn't create this superhero because I just wanted to create another superhero, or I didn't want to just create a superhero that would represent my heritage. I wanted to create a superhero to talk about Puerto Rico in a way that had never been talked about before. You see, a lot of what I'm sharing with you around Puerto Rico and La Borinquena isn't actually taught in Puerto Rican schools on the island. You see, Puerto Rico is a colony in the United States, so they'll learn US history. They'll learn about Susan B. Anthony, who created the American flag, but they won't learn about Mariana Bracetti, who created Puerto Rico's first flag, this flag, La Bandera de la República de Puerto Rico. They'll learn about Francis Ganqui, who wrote the lyrics of the Star Spangled Banner, but they won't learn about Lola Rodriguez de Tio, who wrote the lyrics to the original version of La Borinquena. And they'll learn about mythologies of Rome or Greece and other countries, but they won't even learn about their own island's history. This is another version of Atavex. And in the comic books, Atavex is the mother goddess of the Tainos, but in reality, in history, she was what the Tainos really believed in. And she had two twin sons, Huracan, which is really where the word hurricane comes from. It's actually a Taino word. And her, uh, her sons give her, give Marisol, give La Borinquena these superpowers. Her other son, Yukahu, is the semi of the mountains and the seas. And from there, she draws her super strength. And the character's strength and portrayal is so unique and different that even the Smithsonian Museum of the American Indian reached out to us because they did their first exhibition ever on Tainos. And if you remember, the Tainos were the original people of Puerto Rico, the island of Borinque. And in this exhibition, we see that comic book page on display. And the comic book itself is open. And right next to the comic book is an actual artifact. That artifact is also called a semi. It's a recreation of these goddesses and gods. La Borinquena continues to be exhibited in museums that allow us to introduce the character to larger and new audiences and also allows us to introduce um, new characters from our comic book series. One of our characters is La Balu, who's actually an Asian Dominican, a Chinese Dominican character of Asian Latinx heritage. Our comic book is also celebrated by the Smithsonian Museum because it's been added to the permanent collection. And if you look closely at this exhibition, you'll see Batman, you'll see Superman comic books. And if you look even closer, you'll see La Borinquena 
right there next to the Avengers. This is now part of the permanent collection of the Smithsonian National Museum of American History. And we created these comics because we wanted to show the world what it was to be Latin, what it was to be Puerto Rican. And we wanted to do it through comics. And that's why when a real, real hurricane came to Puerto Rico, and this is actually a scene from the comic book, we decided it was time to do something more than just tell this story. Now, scientists for some time have been saying that Puerto Rico was long overdue for a natural disaster, either earthquakes, or hurricanes. And understanding that, we knew that our stories needed to reflect that. That's why that story of La Borinquina, instead of her finding a supervillain, she actually has to deal with a natural disaster, a hurricane, a real hurricane. But when you write comic books, you can exaggerate, hyperbole. It's great to make the story bigger than reality. I didn't think that reality would actually catch up to the real story. Here's a photo of Puerto Rico at night from a satellite. And here's a photo of Puerto Rico after Hurricane Maria. Hurricane Maria hit Puerto Rico in the year 2017, just four years ago. Left 4,645 lives gone. Destroyed 150,000 families who are now having to move to the United States. 800,000 homes were destroyed. Do you know that most of the island of Puerto Rico went without electricity for 11 months? That's why we decided to do something bigger than just tell our story. We created our project, Reconstruction. This comic book would team up La Borinquena with comic book heroes that all of us grew up with. I grew up with, my mother grew up with, my grandparents grew up with. Superheroes known the world over. Superheroes like Batman, who usually fights supervillains, but in these stories teams up with La Borinquena to learn about the island. And by learning about Puerto Rico, that story teaches others about Puerto Rico. She teams up with Wonder Woman. She teams up with Superman. These teams up, these stories introduce people to Puerto Rico in a way that has never been done before. This is actually an Amazon meeting another Amazon. You see those green parrots on the screen? Those are the Iguacas of Puerto Rico, or as we know them, the Amazons. And Wonder Woman is an Amazon who's finally meeting Puerto Rico's Amazons. The book became such a success for us, and we never expected it to be. It was number one on Amazon.com for four months straight. It helped us raise close to a quarter of a million dollars. And with the success of that, we decided to create the La Borinquena Grants Program, a program that was created to give money back to organizations of Puerto Rico that are real heroes, organizations that reflect what La Borinquena does, organizations that work for environmental justice, sustainable farming, women's health and reproductive rights, programs for children in the areas of art and education, and organizations that preserve and celebrate Afro-Puerto Rican heritage. The work is something that we're so inspired by that every year we return to Puerto Rico and we give grants to these organizations. We give them the money to continue to do the work every day that really inspires us to write these stories. And it's magical to see the inspiration that our character has made on so many. This is a photograph of a young woman dressed as La Borinquena who was marching down the streets of San Juan in the year 2019 for social justice. Because many people in Puerto Rico, even now, even right now in Puerto Rico, are marching through the streets because they want a better Puerto Rico for themselves. Now, even though they're US citizens, they're really treated like second class citizens. And they're constantly having to fight and make a statement for justice. And that's what our comic book tries to do. It tries to remind people that this is not a make-believe character. She's just a reflection of a real group of people that are important and that we have to acknowledge and are part of our country and our, and our identity. And this young woman who dressed up as La Borinquena, she also participated in our award ceremony when we came back to Puerto Rico to make these awards. And that costume that was worn originally by um, a young woman who dressed as La Borinquena for the Puerto Rican Day Parade when we first debuted La Borinquena, 
that was actually a part of another exhibition at the Smithsonian National Museum of American History. It was an exhibition that recreated the reconstruction cover. That cover with Wonder Woman and La Borinquena would be recreated in a real life art exhibition at this museum so that tens of thousands of people, when they came to that museum, they saw Wonder Woman and they also saw La Borinquena and they learned about Puerto Rico through this character. Now, after Hurricane Maria, we've come, we continue to dedicate ourselves to social justice to help. That's why we started Masks for America. During the pandemic, we raised close to $6 million and distributed masks across the United States, particularly in communities of color, tribal nations, and also in Puerto Rico. We were also involved in the last general election. The last general election for president saw the largest turnout of Latinx voters ever in the history of the United States. And maybe we were just like one little grain of sand, one little like effort to help in that. And we produced these commercials to get people to vote. And I'm gonna share with you one of these commercials right now. And this is La Voting Peña telling you to vote. La Voting Peña. Georgia's runoff election is today. It's January 5th, 2021. I'm La Kenya, and I've teamed up with Voto Latino to ensure that Latinx Georgians line up to vote in this runoff election. Today, our vote in Georgia is how we use our power. We will not waste one vote. We are making a difference in this runoff election. We are Latinx. We are American. Our vote today is for racial equity, health care, and for climate justice. We stand here today alongside the African-American community and will do so after this election. Porque las vidas negras importan. We know that there is power in the Senate and we know how our government works. Now, together, unidos, we march to the polls in this runoff election. Our vote will make an impact in Georgia and our country. Vote today, Georgia. Our vote is our power and we will use it in this runoff election. Georgia con ganas. And our work continues. Right now, if you find yourself in a supermarket where you can find habichuelas or salsa de tomate, any other Latin food products, you're going to find these chocolate bars with La Borinquena on them. Because when you purchase these bars, you're going to continue to help our work in Puerto Rico. And that's what La Borinquena is about. She's a superhero that started in the pages of this comic book five years ago. But she's a superhero that inspires me and so many others to do real work in Puerto Rico and across the United States. And that's the message of La Borinquena, that we don't need to have superpowers. We don't even need a cape to be a hero. We just really need to be ourselves and to look at one another and say, how can I be a part of making your life and our community better? And when you do that, you make a difference. And when you do that, you are also yourself La Borinquena. Thank you so much for your time this morning and letting me share my story of La Borinquena. And uh, I hope you guys may have any questions about La Borinquena or any of the information that I shared with you during my presentation. Thank you so much, Agardo. There was a question we have from Stacy Homan, who is a social worker from um, Kennedy High School in Granada Hills, California. And she just commented that this is a terrific presentation. In her school population, there is primarily Latinx students. And her question is, how can we best support educators in acknowledging and allowing students opportunities to seek and promote visibility and representation on campus? By introducing literature, by inviting speakers that reflect their identity and their heritage, oftentimes, um, it isn't just the responsibility of university to have faculty that reflects the diversity of the campus, which is also something that the university institution should always be committed to. But a student's education is also nurtured by the people who visit campus. When I was an undergraduate student myself, I used to visit, I used to invite many people to come visit uh, my school, authors, musicians, um, a, 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 cultural leaders and their, their, their shared stories, their shared experiences were inspiring to not only me, but to also many of my classmates. And also giving me the opportunity to introduce new literature. Our books, um, for example, are taught across the United States at 
public schools of, across um, Washington DC with the support of the Penn Faulkner Foundation, universities like the University of Seattle, Carnegie Mellon, Princeton, um, Penn State are teaching Nabori Kenya because there's a movement now where many scholars are recognizing the, the power of graphic novel storytelling. You see, when you read a graphic novel, you're actually using both sides of your brain. Oftentimes, we use only one side of our brain to analyze visual imagery, the visual arts, for example, and then the other side of our brain to decode text novels. But when you're reading a graphic novel, you're actually engaging both sides of your brain. It's this incredible um, neural experience that you're providing students. What we do with our books, and this is why so many institutions um, have brought our books into classrooms, is we have been able to weave a narrative that integrates a fictional character with real social political issues affecting Puerto Ricans, Latins today. And many of these issues are specific just to Puerto Rico. These are issues that are specific to people everywhere. Environmental, um, environmental issues, environmental justice is something that we're all affected by. Climate change is something that we're all affected by. So I would encourage you to look for scholars or, and, and special guests or just look for new books that you can introduce to, to, to students that really help them see themselves. Oftentimes, one of the things we see frequently and hear frequently from many of our readers or anyone who even like sits in on one of our presentations is that there's just something empowering about seeing a character that looks like them. And oftentimes, as people of color growing up here in, our, in the United States, well, we've become the master of seeing universality in white narratives. And that's just the reality. Most narratives come from the perspective of a white, male, heterosexual, patriarchal perspective. And we are taught to see the universality in all of these characters. But the reality is we should see the universality in characters that also look like us. And well, white people should see the universality in characters that don't look like them. It should be a give and take. It should be a mutual exchange of, of storytelling and, and sharing of ideas and sharing of literature. I hope that helps answer your question. We have another question. As a male creator, how do um, how do we collaborate with women to ensure La Porenqueña's voice is representative of women of color and who decides what she says and how she's represented? Very good question. Um, I'm a man who was raised by a single mother. All of my mentors are women. And my ed editor on the book is actually also a woman, a non-binary, I should be very specific. Uh, we also, as a studio, um, my partner is also my wife. The two of us run this studio together. We are committed to bringing as many women into this industry as possible. Overwhelmingly, the comic book industry is dominated by white men and men in general. There aren't that many women who actually have um, many opportunities. One of the artists that we've been mentoring and having work with our studio, Sabrina Cintron, has been a part of La Borinqueña and, and our studio since 2016. So we're very committed to working with women. We're very committed to in, in, ensuring that the narrative and the voice is, is authentic. I oftentimes do a lot of research, a lot of interviews. Um, Dr. Marta Moreno Vega is one of my mentors, and I frequently um, reach out to her in, in, in support of these stories that, that, that we're writing so that the voice always stays authentic. And I'm very clear that as a man, I have male privilege. I'm also very clear that as a, as a light skin uh, Puerto Rican, I have light skin privilege. And I use these privileges to navigate into these spaces that wouldn't always be available for other people of color, for, all, for women in general. And I do this by forcing the door open to let as many of our people in to have these opportunities. And that's what we're committed to. And it especially is reflected in our philanthropic work because most of the organizations that we support are run by women and are inspiring us to not only continue to support them, but to also carry that inspiration into the pages of La Bolivia as well. We have another question from Elizabeth Shockey. 
what age group is this series recommended for? That's a very good question. When I started writing and producing these books five years ago, I did so with the intention that I wanted to create something that I couldn't, I wouldn't have to hide from my sons. I have two sons. I have a six-year-old now and a 17-year-old. And I never wanted to work on something that I would have to kind of hide. Oh, don't come into the office. Dad is working on this. You can't look at this stuff. It's for grown-ups. Nor that I want to do something that was too infantilized, too juvenile. So I created a comic book based on a comic book that I grew up reading. When I grew up reading comic books as a child, none of the stories were pandering or condescending. Um, if anything, I felt validated as a, as a young reader. So that's why La Guarinqueña is actually read by elementary school students to doctoral students. There's something for everyone in, in these narratives. There, the level of storytelling is not um, elaborate enough that it would turn away a third or fifth grader but it's also not too juvenile that it would dissuade a doctoral student from writing a, a thesis. And many have, and many are writing um, doctoral works inspired and using and referencing La in Kenya. So I would say it's, it's an, it starts at elementary through um, <laughs> well beyond, from eight to 80, I like to, I like to say. I've even done presentations um, for my sons um, when, he was in, um, when he was in kindergarten. Um, as a read along because the first few pages are just uh, rich with imagery uh, around the environment, particularly around um, the wildlife of Puerto Rico with the, the leatherback sea turtles. And it's so engaging that we made it into a talk for, for children. But it's, an all, it's definitely an all audiences um, book. We have another question from Sarah Velez. Thank you, Sarah, for being here. Can you share how you feel about Latinx adolescent health and how La Porenqueña's story can be a practical um, way to support this? And do you feel like there's a, a next passion project or a story for La, for, um, La Porenqueña to tackle and tell? I think it's important to address uh, Latinx health. That is one of the reasons why uh, the character herself is written as having uh, asthma. Um, this is not something that it escapes me, that many young people, particularly Latin, particularly of color living across the United States in, in large concentrated communities of working or poor, working class or poor families tend to be the ones the most afflicted by um, health issues related to, to our environment. The comic book tries to raise awareness because she's living with this. She doesn't get her uh, superpowers and automatically is healed of having asthma. Quite the contrary, the asthma doesn't actually go away. It still stays with her. Because one of the things we don't want to be with our, with our story is dismissive of real health issues that, that affect us as, as a people. Also, one of the most important images, um, or rather imagery relating to La Borinquena, is a comic book in the comic book genre which means that, and rather as a comic book in the superhero genre, which means that you're looking at figures that are drawn um, athletically, they're drawn with form-fitting costumes. For us, it's important to, to share a, a, a healthy body image of La Borinquena. And she's always drawn respectfully, not in a sensational manner. And she's drawn, although she's wearing a form-fitting costume, it also accentuates how full-bodied she is and not anorexically thin, unhealthily thin. We want to kind of like e e share this kind of this idea that you can be a strong woman, you can have a strong body and not have to feel that you are forcing yourself to lose weight or forcing yourself to um, live up to an unhealthy body standard. And in terms of the stories that we're looking to push forward, we're working right now on a new book that will be published uh, for Earth Day We'll be announcing that book in January of next year. And that's a book that's gonna really concentrate around the theme of renewable energy, because that is one thing that is affecting Puerto Rico and the world right now. Puerto Rico is literally going through a power crisis. Uh, there's a new power company that took over the electrical companies 
on the island of Puerto Rico since May. And since May, which is just five months ago, Puerto Ricans have had to have their electric bill increased five times. The average Puerto Rican home is paying about $500 a month for their electrical bill. And the average Puerto Rican home earns about $20,000 a year. So we're creating a project that's really gonna address the need for renewable energy, the need for solar energy, and the, the need to pull away from these archaic fossil fuel formats of using energy, particularly when they're consistently failing. And our hope is that this book not only raises awareness, but also raises money so that we can continue to provide um, services and resources through our La Boringuena Grants Program. Um, and that's, that's really the, 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 the next project that we're working on is, is a story, story around environmental justice and um, renewable energy. We have another question from Maria Elena Romero. And um, she had asked um, a question kind of related to what we talked about a little bit before. So as we move towards teaching ethnic studies, um, K through 12 in the San Francisco Unified School District. What age group do you think your work speaks most directly? And then the follow-up question is, do you know of any similar types of work that can speak to younger students? Um, I'm not too familiar with uh, many works that speak to younger students. I am well aware that many mainstream publishers like Simon & Schuster have developed young uh, adult imprints there's actually a, a, a brand new movement of graphic novels that are created just for um, ages seven to 12. That's a whole demographic that's literally been, been created. La Kenya is, is, is a book that's specifically uh, an old audience's book. I didn't want to create the book that would be to a seven to 12 or a 13 to 18. I wanted it to be a very universal book. And, and that's why many like public schools in the Washington DC district area um, with the support of the Penn Faulkner Foundation are teaching Nahuatl in Kenya and they're being taught in elementary school. And then various universities are also teaching um, our books. And just recently, the University of Puerto Rico made an acquisition of a collection of our books so that they can actually use them in, at the university level in their department of education because now professors who are studying to become teachers and from elementary, intermediate to secondary are looking at bringing in La Kenya as a conduit to open up a dialogue and a, hopefully an academic discourse around Afro-Latin identity. Not that this would be the only book to do that, but it would be kind of like the conduit, the entry to hopefully other scholarship. And that's, that's, that's what La Kenya is able to do because the book is written in, in, in a contemporary context, and I am frequently reading scientific blogs, articles, historical texts, reading on uh, the latest news, and I try to incorporate a lot of these themes into my books. So oftentimes they can be perceived as um, prescient, like I'm prophetically telling the future, but the reality is I'm just listening to uh, political scientists and environmental scientists. And, 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 and as I'm informed by their research, I infuse that into, into the books. And by infusing that into the books, certain things will actually come to, to life. Just like in the first book that was released in December, 2016, we were well aware of the work that, that German Watch was doing and many other scientists were doing to talk about climate change and we, we decided to incorporate that theme into our books. So our books can be very um, easily utilized by a multi-generational audience. It's what the educator takes from the books. And oftentimes the books are dissected. I sat in a course at um, Penn State where a whole class, one whole period was dedicated to just two pages of the comic book. I visited another university where only one panel of, a com of the comic book was actually used as a lesson. So there's a little bit of everything that can be pulled. So it can be read, read cover to cover in class, or it can actually be dissected and supplemented with additional articles that give the work 
some context. And that is what a lot of educators are doing. They'll take a few panels or a few pages from the com comic books and supplement it with some contemporary articles to give the book some context for, for the students that are reading and studying it. Thank you so much, Edgardo. Um, you know, as I, I listened to you, I, you know, originally thought about this uh, series as really promoting literacy and, and, and reading, but I really see it more as much as uh, history and science, which makes me, and you spoke about this a little bit, but I wonder if you had had any official like curriculum to go with this book. You gave a lot of tips in your right. in the last question, but for teachers who, you know, this will be a new thing to use a graphic novel to right. in their class. I've never written the curriculum and all the references that I um, rep that I drew from in my prior um, response is actually inspired by educators that I've met over the last five years. In fact, one educator at my 16 year old school, who was actually a parent teaching co parent teacher coordinator for our, our son's school, uh, just finished her uh, her uh, her master's in education and she prepared a whole curriculum around La Bolivia. And she shared this. We're just getting a tour of, of the school, just like any other parent. And you know, she was very low-key telling me and 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 Kyung, I know who you are. And I did a whole thesis on your uh, on your book. And I was like, oh. So does that mean I get a seat for my son in the school? <laughs> but a lot of a lot of teachers are doing it, and it just um, you know, I think it's more viable and more um, impactful when an educator can literally go through the book themselves and try to feel out where they may want to draw reference and what they may want to um, expand upon, and in, uh, in the classroom setting. And, and you'll find uh, when you do enough research um, on La Guarindena and literally putting my name in the title of the book, there are many are academic articles that have already been written. Um, one as recent as uh, past summer by the Latin American uh, Review, uh, a 20 page article and half of the article is dedicated to how La Guarindena addresses um, climate issues. And so it's, it's, it's interesting to, I can sit here and do it, but I think that's, uh, I don't know, maybe a little pretentious for me to create a curriculum to tell people how they should teach the book. I think it's more powerful when people do it for themselves. It's just this, just uh, I remember growing up as a child uh, reading an article about the poet, um, Robert Frost. Um, and I forget the name of the poem, but it was a poem about like walking through the woods, like the path seldom chosen or something. And, and they, they interviewed him and they asked him, well, what, how, does, how does it feel that your, your poem is taught at schools and universities and, and they're drawing so much reference and so much, you know, in, in, insight from your poetry. And, and he was like, I just wrote a piece about getting lost in the woods. Like, I didn't know where to go left or right, <laughs> you know? And I just think that that's, it's more powerful because, uh, and I have a, and my older son is, uh, is autistic. So I can't, I don't always give him all the answers. And sometimes he's like, well, what, what does this mean? I was like, well, what do you think it means? So I think there's just more power when, when an educator can see the books and draw from the books what they feel is relevant. Because if I did create a curriculum, it may only speak to one specific um, audience or one specific approach, and it would turn off others from possibly seeing what they could draw from it. You know, I, I did a talk one time at my alma mater, and the audience was filled with a few hundred undergraduate students. And there were four different courses, four different courses that made up the audience of that room, four different courses that were studying La Bolivia that very same semester, a course on women's studies, a course on LGBTQ studies, a course on graphic novel production, and a course on Puerto Rican um, history, four different courses. And they all were studying the exact same books and, and that blew me away. So, Thank you so much, Edgardo. We're coming to the end of our hour. So I want to I want to again thank all of the schools who are participating um, today and who have participated and for um, Edgardo for his his fabulous talk that that I find very inspirational. Um, I want to also give thanks. I'd be amiss to sort of uh, not, you know, I need to give thanks to the San Francisco Hospital Foundation Hearts Grants that su supported um, uh, Edgardo's talk today. And a teaser, 
uh, you're going to see more coming from La Borinquena. Um, we are working on a project uh, with Edgardo, looking at the Borinquena and seeing uh, with a group of young people who are part of a program we have here at San Francisco General Hospital called Change SF. And we're gonna be looking at the Borinquena as a messenger of um, mental health and resiliency and, uh, and um, uh, racial justice um, in this time that we're all living in. So look towards that and we might be asking you some questions of how we best can um, sort of message this through uh, the voice of La Borinquena and the arts. So thank you so much everyone for participating today and, um, and we look forward to talking more into the future. Thank you everyone.